Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about a, a difficult subject, one that most people may think no longer exists in the world, and that's the subject of slavery, which still goes on in various parts of the world. Our guest tonight is Sean Tenner, the co-founder of Abolition... Uh, uh, I'm going to get this completely wrong. <laughs> Society for Abolition of Slavery. Uh, it's called the Abolition, Abolition Institute. Abolition Institute. Um, which is all about discovering the fact that slavery still exists in this world and trying to work to get rid of it, right? And, and so we think of, at least I think of abolitionism as something from the American Civil War, right? right? And you think, oh, well, that was way back then. That was you know, 150, 200 years ago. But it's still happening in the world today, right? So tell me a little bit about this and how you discovered it and came to be involved in it. Sure. Well, of course, there's been a great amount of attention in recent years to the subject of human trafficking and sex trafficking. And, you know, governments around the world, including our own, have done a lot of great work to try to address this. Um, but the, the fact remains that there are actually more people enslaved right now than at any point in human history. Um, You're kidding me. I mean, more, more than More people enslaved right now than at any point in human history. But so much of this is in the shadows. Every country... Um, if you look at a website, um, the Global Slavery Index, uh, globalslaveryindex.org, um, they've actually got an estimate of how many people are enslaved in every country. And in many of the Western countries, uh, many of the people enslaved are uh, forced into prostitution, um, they're forced into brothels, uh, um, uh, domestic servants. Um, Slavery takes on a different tone depending on the, the culture and the country and the politics and the economy uh, of where it takes place. Now, but when we think about slavery, um, you know, the, the, I think the, the vision in my head, certainly, and maybe in many Americans' heads, is, is that of, you know, the southern plantation with right. the slaves who lived on the plantation. Right. And, 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 um, but are we also talking about things like um, illegal sweatshops where people come in from another country and they're essentially held against their will um, but it's not like a plantation. They don't live on a large area, but they are nonetheless kept captive. And is it, is it actually captive, or they just don't feel that they can break free? Like, for example, if you came over and I grabbed your passport or all mm -hmm. of your identification and said, well, if you don't show up for work every day, I'm going to turn you in, and you're going to be sure. deported or, or imprisoned or whatever, that might mean, well, you ac might actually have a place to live that's not the factory or wherever, but you're still entrapped. Is that the well, same thing? Uh, statelessness and slavery are very much intertwined in many mm -hmm. countries around the world. For example, in the border regions between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, um, there are smugglers who will try to lure people over from Haiti with the promise of uh, a good job, uh, working in the sugar, working in the sugar plantations, education, health care, housing. You know, come on over. It's it's much better. You'll have a good life here. Mm -hmm. um, once people are brought over. They take their passports, they take their paperwork, and then you essentially become a, a stateless, a stateless person trapped in this no man's land. You, you can't go back to Haiti, and you can't go anywhere else in the Dominican Republic without your without your papers. So you then become essentially a slave in these sugar plantations. Um, and there were there were activists with the Catholic Church who tried to uh, draw attention to these issues, who were. Uh, who were persecuted and, and murdered because a lot of people who run these trafficking rings will stop at nothing to, to be money. able to continue making their money and exploiting other human beings. It, it really is, it's, it's a dark subject, don't, don't get me wrong, but the, um, the Global Slavery Index, I think, gives you a good glimpse into um, what are the different forms of, of modern slavery and also mm -hmm. what are governments doing to fight it. And our, now, our own country. Oh, who maintains that, um, that index? Who creates that index? Is that the U.S.? Um, it was actually started as a, a project by a gentleman named Andrew Forrest, uh, who started the Walk Free Foundation, mm -hmm. um, under, the, you know, under the assumption that to really address the problem, we first had to understand the scope of it. Um, I think people generally know about human trafficking mm -hmm. and sex trafficking. And, and I would add that uh, you know, Chicago, unfortunately, is uh, uh, certainly a national hub. For, really? uh, for trafficking because of O'Hare Airport. Uh, transportation, you have right. so many people coming in, so mm -hmm. many people going out. Uh, we have major interstates. You know, unfortunately, everywhere that people congregate en masse, uh, 
becomes a center for human trafficking. And they, they say the, the Super Bowl, uh, regardless of where it's held, becomes one of the epicenters of, of human trafficking every single year because, because you have just, a lot of people with money, yeah, um, a lot of people who are there to quote unquote have, have a good time. Mm -hmm. And the traffickers realize this and they go straight to where the money is. So it's like a, a pop-up brothel. Absolutely. Right. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so and how how does one gather the data about this? Like, it is it all happens, or I'm sure much of it happens in the shadows. Right. It's not as though governments are keeping track of this, or they you know they're publishing economic statistics about slavery in their country. So how does this uh, institute uh, go about figuring out what the scope of the problem is? Well, it it is very difficult, and I, and I think. Uh, that foundation and other foundations that calculate the data would say that no no number is precise mm. um, but there are some there are some countries um, Uzbekistan for example um, very over very overt about making their citizens come and work the cotton harvest cotton is the biggest um, I believe the biggest export in mm. uh, in Uzbekistan um, and they essentially turn right yeah. they they essentially turn a good ch very overtly turn a good chunk of their population um, into forced laborers during the time of the cotton harvest. And, you know, so I think in mm -hmm. that case, it's, it's very, it, it's well documented. Mm -hmm. um, now in, in Mauritania, it's, it's, very, it's very pernicious what the government does because to get to that point um, of, well, you know, how, how do you know, um, how does your government know there's slavery here? How does the UN know there's slavery here? Um, when they do their census, of course they don't have a, a box that says, I'm enslaved. Are you a slave? Right. They manipulate the census statistics to try to show that their, um, you know, their dominant group, their dominant caste um, is, is larger than it really is. And in, in Mauritania, of course, there's no, um, th there's no official number, but we have to go by the number of people who escape and come to the offices of our partner organizations. And, and so you, you try know, to extrapolate from the number who actually do get out. Is that kind that of is, that is that is one tool. Yeah. And of course, in other countries, um, law enforcement statistics are useful. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are. I've met so many people in law enforcement, from police officers to judges and everybody in between, who see this as the most important thing they can do is rescuing um, rescuing people from trafficking. Mm -hmm. So th there are arrests, and you know, I think unfortunately, with any crime, often the the police and the criminal justice system, they know, well, you know, if we catch, uh, if we get 10,000 people doing this, you know, we know based on the data that there's probably 100,000 people out there that we can't catch. And that's why, you know, until nobody is trafficked in the United mm -hmm. States, and until nobody is, you know, enslaved in Mauritania, we have to, we have to keep fighting. You know, I, I make an analogy with, um, with breast cancer. I've worked with the Komen Foundation um, for about 15 years now. And you know, people will say, uh, well, the government, you know, the government just uh, awarded a, a good amount of money to uh, breast cancer research, you know, isn't, mm -hmm. are you guys still asking for more? I say, until there's nobody in the state of Illinois who dies of breast cancer, we have to keep, we have to keep fighting. Sure. And people, people thought abolishing slavery in the United States would never happen. As, as late as, you know, I'm fascinated by the, the politics behind abolition, both in Britain and in the United States. And as late as 1963, they said, no, Lincoln's going to end the war, and the, the war is going to end on a basis of um, some continuation of, of slavery in the South. I mean, the, the confluence of factors that led to slavery being completely abolished by 1865, if you would put odds on it even five years before, say, no way does, does slavery go away. It's too entrenched. Well, I understand even Lincoln himself was not an abolitionist prior to the war. Correct. Um, and it was really the, the conduct of or how the war was progressing that he realized. And it was as much a, a political move as one of moral imperative that he felt that, that uh, you know, freeing the slaves was a way to round up more support for his, what was a war effort that wasn't actually going all that well. Right. So um, even there, you know, we think, well, everyone kind of became a, enlightened and said, well, this must no. be abolished. But it <laughs> but wasn't necessarily all. that way. Well, I think to Lincoln's credit, if you look, and I've I've tried to research as much as I could about about him, and um, there was a there was a book called The Fiery Trial um, about Lincoln and his struggles 
uh, internally mm -hmm. on what to do about slavery. And there's actually very little written about it because it was such, uh, the mo to say it was a controversial issue yeah, is yeah, yeah. the understatement yeah, of the yeah. century. Yes. But he clearly, he clearly knew the less he said about it, mm -hmm. the, the, the better for mm -hmm. his political career. So these writings have to be scrutinized very carefully. Um, but what's unambiguous is that Lincoln was inspired by the, the brave conduct of African-American soldiers who fought for the Union Army. And it made him mm -hmm. think twice uh, about his, his previous notions on, uh, on racial equality or, or inequality. Well, I uh, also read recently about, uh, prior to the Civil War, um, the Congress, of course, was great, greatly divided on whether slavery should be allowed or not. And the, right. uh, there was actually legislation passed where um, slaves who had escaped to the North and had become essentially free citizens mm -hmm. could be returned back to their slave owners because they were still considered property. So even in states where slavery was not practiced, um, this was, a, I guess, what they called a compromise then. Um, where the, the southern states said, look, you have to give them back. This is our property. And the northern states said, yeah, well, okay, what do we get in return? And it was a negotiating. It was so, ironic that the, yeah. the South, uh, which was constantly complaining about an, an, over, an overreaching uh, federal government, a tyrannical federal government trampling over the rights mm -hmm. of states and localities, when it came to um, you know, police officers taking human beings alive and transporting mm. them back to slavery. They were all about having a strong federal government right, at, could at do that, that point. Right. That was, I think most historians would say, the worst law ever passed by Congress. Yeah. And I saw yeah. a play a couple years ago called The Bloodhound Law, which is what detractors of the Fugitive Slave Act mm -hmm. called it. And we have some things to be proud of in Chicago and Illinois because the Chicago City Council, um, which often doesn't get great headlines. The Chicago City Council um, in, in the 1850s actually held hearings about the horrific abuses that happened because of the Fugitive mm -hmm. Slave Act and said, we're just not going to, we're not going to recognize it. We're not going to enforce it. This is, this is pure evil. The first sanctuary city. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. And I think in politics, I, I dabble in politics, as you, as you know. <laughs> yes, we won't go I into think that in everybody, this show, but yes. Yeah. I think people score points by running down Illinois and um, you know, co complaining, complaining about our state constantly. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, you know, if, there's any, if there's any place that uh, has a proud legacy on this issue, despite, you know, despite our flaws in Illinois, mm -hmm. you know, there's no place in the world more associated with the fighting against slavery than Illinois. And that is why we call our organization the Abolition Institute. And that's why we try to base what we do on the example that was set by abolitionists from Illinois over 150 years ago. And well, not I, just those that you've, you've heard about, not just President Lincoln and mm -hmm. President Grant, but think of all the, uh, the African-American and white soldiers mm -hmm. um, who fought in the Union Army to abolish slavery. Now, I would say a majority did not fight to abolish slavery. Some fought because... Um, it, it, was an opportun it was an opportunity for advancement. Some fought because they just saw it as their duty to fight for their country. But it, it's unmistakable that thousands and thousands of people you know, fought because they wanted, they wanted to end slavery. And so I want to go back to the name of the, of the organization, the Abolition Institute. Um, there is something that sounds um, archaic mm -hmm. about it, and, and I'm, I'm sure that's deliberate. Right? Absolutely. Because you want people to think, oh, abolitionist, oh, come on, that's, that's over and done. Right. And it's to provoke that reaction Absolutely. Right? and then say, well, no, it's not. Absolutely. So the thing I wanted to follow up on uh, from that, though, is also you know, this, the in uh, Institute looks a lot at Mauritania. And if it's a worldwide problem, why focus on that country? Is it particularly bad there, or is that a center of activity? Well, uh, many, you know, many books and many research, uh, much research has been done on Mauritania. And, and almost incalculable amount of research has been done on, uh, on, on slavery in Mauritania. This is an issue that goes back mm -hmm. um, several hundred years since the first wave of um, invaders came from the east and uh, largely killed or enslaved the, the native population. But slavery in Mauritania is, is unique in that in that country it is most reminiscent of what we had in the United States before the Civil War. Now, uh, slaves are not sold publicly anymore. Um, a few, decade, a few decades ago they were. Um, there are not public whipping posts, there are not public slave auctions, but 
slaves are held in, in bondage for life. It is race and descent-based slavery. It is not trafficking, mm. although trafficking does occur there, and we fight that as well. Um, but it is not trafficking in the sense that you are, you are born a slave, you die a slave, mm. you can be bought, sold, traded, often given as a wedding gift. And the, the women, it, it's particularly cruel to women and children because um, if you have a male slave, well, perhaps the male slave runs away and mm -hmm. then you're, you, know, you, you don't have that person's labor. Uh, but a female slave um, can have child after child after child, often from the master mm -hmm. uh, himself or his family. And what does that do? It creates uh, more people to, more serve, to serve the master. Right. So a female slave is actually much more valuable in the eyes of the slaveholder than a male slave. And no. it's also easier for, uh, it's easier in a way for um, men to, uh, to escape, to, to run away. But, you know, women have you know, more often than not children, children with them. And right. what, what sort of life is that to leave, even if you are able to mm -hmm. escape across the desert, to leave your children to suffer uh, a fate worse than death, frankly, that, that's not real freedom. So going back to something you said a minute ago, though, um, Maybe this is just my Western sensibility, mm -hmm. uh, but the idea that, the, and I know this happened in, in the United States, that the master would have um, children with the slave women. But then and I would say in Mauritania, um, the, the 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 sexual abuse, sexual assault of slaves is not the aberration. I mean that no, that is the norm. the norm. Their bodies belong to the master. They don't belong to themselves. They belong to someone else. But that the master would would feel no connection to those children. You know, that's what really kind of baffles me. It's one of the most twisted things about yeah. the institution of slavery, the, the, way it, uh, the way it degrades both, both sides. I mean, I've always, mm -hmm. um, I've always wondered about all the children who were brought up in the pre-Civil War South who were raised by um, African-American uh, African -American women. Um, so you have, that, you have that tender relationship between both sides, mm -hmm. and then what must what must it have been like to see that person whipped or, or sold off or, or shipped away never to be seen again? The, the, person, the person that raised you, yeah. the, it, it, it's so twisted, I, I still yeah, can't wrap it, my head around it. It, it, is, it is twisted, and, and it, um, it represents, I think, one of the darkest sides of the human soul that you can fall victim to. Um, so what kinds of, of, of activities globally are, are taking place, first of all, to, um, to measure the problem, sure. uh, but just as importantly to, to try to get at it. And, and I say that because how we opened the show when you said there are more people enslaved now than mm -hmm. ever before in history. Um, and I guess I would have a question, is that as a percentage of the overall population? Large population. Yeah, there's more people on the planet than ever before. Right. Um, yeah, but still, the idea that, that there are more people enslaved than ever before is uh, shocking. So. Yes. What are we doing wrong? <laughs> Why is it a growing problem instead of a shrinking problem? Well, um, to get to your question about the measurement of the mm -hmm. problem, um, th there's two reports that the U.S. State Department does that I find, um, I am impressed that they put this level of uh, work and attention and, and resource into these reports. They do an annual survey of every country on earth. Uh, it's called the Trafficking in Persons Report, mm -hmm. and it measures the existence of trafficking, forced labor, slavery in every country, and then measures the government's response to it. So you could have a country, mm -hmm. um, there are many countries which are very poor, and they have traffickers operating within their country, but the government is resolute in doing everything it can to, to staunch the, mm -hmm. the, the, the work of the traffickers. And you have other countries, some of which are very affluent, that don't don't pay it any attention. They, they so, then so it's the not there, right? Of course. Yeah. Well, and and for any government, if you're trying to project a uh, an image of uh, modernity, mm -hmm. you're trying to sure. you know, be accepted in the international arena. Are you going to admit that you have a la large percentage of your own country enslaved? Of course not. But no. there are some countries that, um, even though they're very uh, very poor, do t do take it seriously, and. 
you know, I think that's a great report. Anybody who wants to understand the scope of the problem around the country should look at it. And I've met the State Department mm -hmm. researchers who work on it, and it's, it's incredibly hard, but it's incredibly valuable. And uh, when the government evaluates um, trade, trade benefits, uh, bilateral relationships, um, the TIPS, TIPS report, Trafficking in mm -hmm. Persons, uh, report is valuable. And we also do a study of every country on human rights writ large. And if you read more, if you read the reports on Mauritania, unfortunately, it's the lowest tier on on both fronts. And you read about the type of you read about the type of um, abuse that the slaves suffer, and then almost as shocking is the the fact that the government, um, for the most part, does not denies that it exists. Um, sometimes they contradict themselves. They'll mm -hmm. set up an, a, a sort of toothless agency mm -hmm. um, to uh, address the. The, the vestiges of, of slavery is what they'll say. And they can't bring themselves to say slavery. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, deny, you know, d deny, that there's a, deny that there's a problem. But, you know, the, the, the fact that so many uh, international organizations, so many UN investigators, so many US investigators, so many uh, researchers and nonprofit leaders um, have spoken out on Mauritania, I think speaks to the the severity of the problem there, and in fact, just uh, just about a month ago, the United States revoked uh, what is called the uh, AGOA African Growth and Opportunity Act uh, trade benefits for Mauritania, specifically because of the ex existence of slavery. And this is a very this is a very strong step. I think uh, Democratic and Republican administrations mm -hmm. have said. I think they recognize that no country is perfect, and and often they try to give countries the benefit of the doubt if they believe they're seriously addressing a problem. But in this case, it is so, it is so un un unequivocal. Yeah. Um, the, the slaveholding caste, which rules the, uh, the political infrastructure of the country, the government and the economy, um, benefits, benefits from this system and therefore they, they continue it. So what are the uh, consequences uh, to have, what's it, AGOA, is that how it's pronounced? Mm -hmm. That, that, that um, distinction, to have that Retracted. I mean, is that are the trade? It's very, it's very serious. It's Financial absolutely consequences. trade consequences. Yeah. Um, Mor Mauritania has uh, begun to exp export more minerals. Um, it, you know, it's it's becoming. Uh, you know, in fact, mm -hmm. I, I looked at the statistics just the other day. Between 2007 and uh, 2018, Mauritanian exports to the United States grew uh, nearly 8,000 percent. Uh, there are a lot of companies and a lot of countries that are looking at the minerals, looking at the fishing resources, um, looking at everything that's underneath the surface. Mortani actually has the, the world's longest train um, because there's so much iron ore there um, in, uh, in one city that it goes uh, three kilometers from uh, one training port to another every, every single day. So you can imagine the amount of wealth that's underneath. The train uh, itself extends three kilometers. Yes. Not the tracks, the train. The train, yes. Wow. Yeah. So we have to let companies know that, uh, you know, while we, we want to raise, you know, we certainly support raising the standard of living for everybody who, who lives in Mauritania. And we, we're, not about, um, we're not about denigrating people who live there. Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes when we talk about um, countries like oh. Iran or North Korea, sure. we Everyone. tend to conflate the, the leader, the president, with all the people, all the people underneath. I think they do that about this country. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they, I'm well. sure they do. Yeah, yeah. So we we yeah. want to help Mauritania, and in fact, we um, we had a delegation of uh, civil rights, human rights, and Islamic leaders. Um, there were a dozen of us that went to Mauritania in um, uh, the fall of 2017, mm -hmm. and we went there with the goal of finding how can we build partnerships with uh, civil society, nonprofit groups. Um, expand connections between the two countries and the two movements. Um, and we did this in full, um, you know, in cooperation mm -hmm. and uh, with a great deal of planning with our U.S. Embassy and with um, the United States government, who in turn was collaborating with the, um, the Mauritanian mm -hmm. government. Um, so we went there with every expectation of being able to work on a whole variety of, of subjects to raise the you know, ra raise the floor as and, it were. And were you at, able to do that? I mean, um, well, at the at the last minute, as we were boarding, as we were all boarding the final uh, leg of the flight from Paris to Mauritania, um, 
the ambassador had been trying to get a hold of me, finally did, right, as we were about to step on the, on the plane, and we're told that um, the Mauritanian government decided to put its foot down and they weren't going to let us in. So we were detained for about wow. 10 hours in the, uh, in the airport in Mauritania. Mm -hmm. I was with uh, Jonathan Jackson, uh, Professor Jonathan Jackson, whose father um, is Reverend Jesse Jackson. Oh, okay. um, Jonathan Jackson is, um, you know, a lead national spokesperson mm -hmm. for Rainbow Push. Um, we had judges, attorneys, um, Rhyme Fest, who's an Academy Award and Grammy winning uh, recording artist, um, a, a, a wonderful so cross section quite a delegation. of leaders. Right. Yep. And they, um, they just said no. Escorted us from the plane, took the passports, showed us the machine guns, and um, you know we stayed there. Um, you know, t to the great credit of the U.S. ambassador at the time, Larry Andre, he said, "I, you know, I'm coming to the airport, and I am not going to leave until." You know, everybody is safely, you know, safely somewhere else, um, and it was a it was a huge story. And wow. if they had nothing to hide, yeah, why, why would, you would do they? That? Why would they do that? Yeah, uh, you know, a group comes to meet with um, civil society. So never, that's not a news story. You never got in, right? I mean, they sent you. I had been to Mauritania no, in that, uh, 2015. At that time, no, we but did that not get in. that particular trip. Okay. So, you know, everybody was committed to continuing. Mm -hmm. um, continuing this this voyage and and working to this end so we actually went to uh, we went to senegal instead i'll spare you the travel and uh, <laughs> yeah. logistics details yeah. but i said let's let's go to senegal mm -hmm. and let's see a different approach towards human rights uh, a different approach towards intertwining development uh, development and human rights and you know we met with um, countless people who had um, you know, who had fled mm -hmm. the slavery system in, in Mauritania. And made um, it over to Senegal. They got out of the country. And I, I mean, I remember the most, the most poignant part of that trip was uh, meeting a girl who I, I think was 16 or 17 who had been, um, you know, raped by her master at 13, had a child. Um, you know, there was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a scandal about it in this, mm -hmm. in this household. So they sent her to live with the, uh, the brother of the master who also raped and impregnated her. So here's this girl at 16 years old with two, two kids, two children from two different uh, Man, rapists, right, right. masters, call it, call it what you will. And to be able to, you know, dialogue with somebody who's been like that, it's a that, you know, for, for our group to interact and, and hear firsthand those stories that made all the you know all, well, all the drama of going yeah. uh, everything that we went through mm -hmm. to get there it made it all worth it so people could bring that story back to America so what is uh, what, what is the the goal of the Institute uh, direct I mean pragmatically what should Americans do and we only have about a minute and a half left sure. here so we sure have to be sitting down this but um, what is it that, that Americans need to be thinking about and doing right now sure well we have we have some agenda items for the coming Congress that are very important. I would say anybody watching the show, mm -hmm. uh, they can get a hold of us through our website, mm -hmm. stoppingslavery.org, uh, Sean at stoppingslavery.org. We're going to be looking to hold hearings about what happens to the money that is generated by the Mauritanian slavery system. Where does it go? And making sure that the U.S. government is doing everything it can to stop people from this profiting. Be congressional hearings that you're talking yes. about? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. So. In, in investigating where that money goes and making sure any company thinking of doing business in Mauritania um, understand, you know, understands the situation there and is committed to stopping slavery as part of their um, investment in the country. Two, and we, we look to continue... You got 10 seconds. Oh, sure. Two. Looking to continue congressional funding for programs that fight slavery in Mauritania and the region. Sean, I'm fascinated, and I can't believe that, that we're already out of time. Oh. I could talk about this all night. So thank you for all the work that you do. Thank you. And thank you for being on the show. Thank you. So we've been visiting with Sean Tenner tonight, uh, the co-founder of the Abolition Insti Abolitionist Institute. I'll get that right at some point in the show. Uh, I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. You can see us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19 or find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So until next time, thank you and good night. Stay Tell with me the... Thank you.